Okay. So thanks, Irena. Thanks, everyone. This was this was very very nice uh, and very fun. Um, you made it. Also, congratulations to all of you. You made it to the <laughs> closing session of the conference. Yeah. Um, and it's um, it has a significant title: uh, aftershock. It's like life after shock. Synergies along the journey to EOS can view into the future. Uh, now, there are some rules about the closing session. It's a very complicated one. Uh, we have very, very esteemed speakers, uh, five of them, and then a panel of six people. So uh, there will be Francisca de Jong, that you already saw from, from Clarin, Giovanni Lamana from Escape Cluster, Ute Gunzenheimer from EOSC Association, Ron Decker from EOSC Future Project, uh, and Laura Morales, our very own, again, from, from Shock. Um, so, um, and then uh, Rudolf Dimper from Panos Cluster will join us uh, in the panel. Now, each of presenters will have around five minutes to sort of pitch uh, their uh, vision of, uh, of uh, this journey to EOSC uh, from their very, very specific perspectives and, and how we can collaborate in the future or how to make synergies in the future. So five minutes each. After that, we will go to the, to the questions. Uh, they are pre-prepared. We uh, thought quite a lot what to ask our, our presenters. So um, I would like to go through the questions with some of them, but then, of course, um, answering will be open to, to the whole panel. Uh, and after that, we should go to the questions from the audience and from the online participants. Um, on that note, I would like to ask our online participants to put their questions in the chat so that Marike in the back can, can, can read them when the time comes, when we'll com combine questions from the audience and, and from, the, um, from the chat. And finally, there will be a couple of wrap-up slides. So, um, you know the structure, we should just kick it off. And I would like to invite uh, Francisca de Jong uh, to, to come to the stage and inform us or sort of give us the summary of the policy session. Uh, you already heard her, her bio, but let me just repeat it and remind you that Francisca is the executive director of Clarin. Uh, she has many, many hats. She is the member of the first year of SHOCK. Uh, she is also uh, in the executive board of uh, ERIC Forum. She is and was and is part of the advisory group of EOS on sustainability. And I probably forgot something, but you have too many hats, Francisca. So <laughs> please come in. Yeah, and you reminded me of the fact that I should have uh, taken the, the shock cap with me today, but uh, <laughs> for another moment. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my, uh, the request was to summarize for you the, the policy meeting that we had yesterday with uh, representatives of uh, uh, several organizations. So first of all, it was the leadership of, uh, of the shock uh, project, so uh, all the directors of the um, um, the research infrastructures, the ERICs, and the, um, sorry? Mic doesn't work, okay. Like this? Yeah, better. Um, the directors of the uh, of the ERICs involved and uh, the leadership of uh, ERIES, um, representatives of the European Commission, of ESRI, of um, uh, EELSC Association, uh, and uh, the very special format of that meeting was that we also invited the leaders of the other uh, clusters, so there were representatives of the other clusters as well. Um, I try to summarize the main messages that uh, somehow emerged from that uh, very interesting and, and uh, open discussion. Um, uh, so five topics. First of all, it was uh, agreed that uh, sustainability of, uh, of the EOSC clusters or the S3 clusters, because that's where it started, um, um, it's not even a question, it's a must. And um, as this event demonstrates, uh, shock is more than ready for it. The sea of cloud is already, has become the, the sea of cluster. And so we're not ending this project, but developing, uh, working on the development of a more uh, formal um, and sustainable form of co collaboration and communication. We will keep working on, keep working together on um, our federated service offer and the marketplace as our common shop window. We are really ready for the next level. Um, but of course, we will also keep an eye on uh, um, the, the further development of the individual uh, 
um, research infrastructures involved to make sure that their operations and, and service offer and outreach is optimal for the communities they serve. And this is, of course, very well aligned with the model that we have of being a, a network of, of, of repositories and communities. Um, so, I don't know, but even here I sometimes sense the misunderstanding that for example, the marketplace could be a place where you could store your data. That's not the case. We have the repositories for that. Same story about EOSC. EOSC is not a place where you can store your data. They will give pointers to where the data is stored. Okay, um, second, second bullet. Uh, the, the widely understood need for a structured dialogue between the clusters and the various stakeholders. We feel that within Shock, we have already proved that we are able to organize that with parties from within and outside of the clusters, uh, as it was uh, phrased this morning by the slide uh, from Sally uh, Chambers. Uh, we have managed to create a magnified voice at all levels of uh, European policy formation. Um, what is important is that um, the European Commission people explain to us that they'd like us to uh, show that we can um, that we can promote our results and outcomes and vision at the policy level, um, and uh, so we feel we've already achieved a lot. Uh, but they would welcome any further development of that capacity. Then, um, of course, also mentioned various time here, uh, there is a need for stable support slash funding uh, for the for the uh, activities of the of the clusters it has been built up through European project with funding um, but uh, right now that funding is um, not available in the same way as it used to be a few years ago but everybody understands that if the clusters are a success they need policy and uh, probably also some funding support so that message is clear then, uh, about the impact of our activities. The EC clearly um, indicated the uh, request to um, make sure that we can track down the impact that we have, both in terms of um, the impact of the results, but also the uptake beyond academia. Uh, they underlined, and we understand this very well, that we might have a contribution to um, the process of the, the overall digital transformation that uh, is happening in society. So this is something that should be incorporated in, in any next program. But of course, uh, we've already done a lot of things uh, beyond the uptake of, um, of our results in, in research communities. Not always easy to, men to measure uh, under the open science model, but it's another thing. Um, our impact to society, We've also shown already a number of very uh, solid examples. So the response to COVID that mentioned uh, this morning, the, the science project in, uh, in EOSC Future run by the SSH research infrastructures and the contributions to the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. But another question that came up was whether or not we would be able to go all the way down to teachers, schools and, and pupils. Would they if they knew we existed, would they use our services? Interesting question. We should pay a bit more attention to that. And then last one, um, um, the angle of the uh, EOSC association. It was very clear that um, uh, the, the high value of the thematic angle provided by the clusters is recognized. So clearly no uh, disagreement about the fact that without thematic services, there is no real EOSC. Um, but the EOSC Association has indicated that uh, they will set up communication channels with the clusters. So I think we, uh, after yesterday, we can be sure that uh, we won't be left alone. And I think uh, that's uh, uh, a good achievement. So thank you all for contributing to that. For, to Francisca for this summary. Um, and now we go to um, 
ES clusters. Uh, we dip into that their angle uh, with Giovanni Lamana, representative of Escape Project. Very briefly, uh, Giovanni is the director of CNRS Lab Laboratory in France. He is a physicist with special interest with, uh, in interfacing uh, particle physics and astrophysics. Uh, uh, you have been involved in the conception and preparation of the CTA Observatory, which is an astral landmark, serving as coordinator of the data management project and having a leading role in the design and construction of the first large-sized telescope deployed at La Palma Island, which is very impressive. Uh, welcome, Giovanni. The floor is yours. to use this one. Okay. Good. So, thank you for the introduction. Above all, I'm the coordinator of ESCAPE cluster. And uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation. Uh, don't count this in my, in my scheduled five minutes. Just to say that it was a pleasure to come back to Brussels, to attend after a long time in person a conference and to meet my friends and also having the possibility to uh, share some thoughts and discussions like the one that was summarized briefly by Francisca before me. Um, so, um, so I will not talk about escape. I want to talk about the, 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 the clusters. So just uh, telling you the following. Um, it has been mentioned that the five clusters uh, and very fair uh, EOS Clive, Panos, Escape, uh, Shock. Um, have been working together uh, during uh, the last years in the sense that we have been uh, um, building um, uh, bridges among us, uh, shaping also our vision for the future. And uh, at the end, uh, uh, very recently, one year ago almost, we published a shared uh, position document where we uh, focused also on uh, the achievements uh, and the long-term uh, perspectives for the clusters. Um, I'm here summarizing two, three main uh, um, uh, elements of such a, a position and such a vision. First of all, uh, um, uh, I would like to remind you that uh, in each one of the five clusters, uh, we acknowledge the success of uh, bridging sociological and technical barriers already within the large domain encompassed by each cluster. Each cluster. And now we are having the possibility to go further with some potential interdisciplinary actions among the, the, the cluster, um, among the clusters. Um, uh, the, um, what I also say is that uh, um, the, 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 the division was a structure also based on, the, on three momenta, as uh, uh, are shown here. Uh, first, the capacity of a sort of top-down approach of federating the uh, legal entities, the S3 legal entities. And this is uh, thanks to them and thanks to such commitments that we build a cross-fertilization action. Then such a cross-fertilization action is also now um, experienced, acknowledged, and then strongly support, supported bottom-up by the concerned scientists, engineers, data scientists, who are asking us to give continuation and sustainability to the action. Finally, there is also a sort of horizontal momentum that is the capacity of leveraging the participation in the endeavor of university institutes and matching the global European approach with also national or regional uh, plans. Um, what else uh, it is important to mention uh, um, today? Um, uh, the, the, the challenges of open research data, yes, the research infrastructures encompassed by, uh, the five, within the five classes are at the same time data producers and data consumers. And this makes a difference. This means that uh, we are uh, tuning uh, um, the um, expectation and requirements of scientists. And we want to do this. We don't want to run after schemes if such a scheme are not uh, helping science um, and uh, researchers. For uh, this reason, what we see is that uh, 
um, together from one side the clusters are developing mid-level multidisciplinary tools and services and platforms and you have you have been exposed to a huge list of them during a, such a conclusive workshop of shock but in the same time all together individually and all together in a group for the future we do hope um, indeed we are trying to changing the way to perform research by um, uh, associating to each scientific results as it is published in, a, in an article in a journal with all digital objects that can be useful to reproduce the results and to produce new science on top of such results. This is uh, our way of the clusters so of implementing our own virtual research environments and to use a sentence that is one of the pillars of the EOSC architecture is uh, the population of a web of fair data and services for science at the end. Um, uh, we keep uh, close uh, the uh, requirements and the interest of the community and we do our efforts uh, to enhance the participation of, research of researchers in our activity. And then finally, uh, what else I add, that the cross-cluster, yes, it is important that in our position we also try to um, make a step forward, um, visioning the fact that from one side we need to keep the scientific agenda first of all. We need to keep our focus on our science because this is uh, the matter. Other things are not uh, uh, in the uh, scope of the activities and the interest of scientists. But in the same time, we are aware of the fact that there are uh, challenge-driven uh, topics uh, in the global uh, European Union member states policies. And we want to also be uh, propedeutic to that. We want to cooperate to work uh, around uh, so, such challenges altogether in an interdisciplinary context and the cluster represent the correct and more, uh, let's say, evident platform to perform such, uh, um, such uh, an approach. Thanks. <laughs> Giovanni, and now we move to EOSC Association and to Ute Gunzenheimer. Welcome, Ute. Uh, just a few words. Uh, Ute joined the association in summer 21, uh, built it from scratch single handedly, uh, and then became the Secretary General in November. Before that, uh, part of uh, Spallation Source in Lund as head of uh, international relations and uh, yeah, international relations and, and EU projects. And uh, I have to say, I had the privilege to, to work with you on KPIs within the ERIC Forum implementation project. So, but this time with uh, EA hat. Green. Okay. So thank you very much for inviting me. I'm Ute Gunzenheimer and before I joined the EOSC Association I was in the purple cluster and I spent quite a lot of time interacting with the other clusters as Ivana said in the ERIC forum as well as, well as in Enrich and also I tried to bring the purple cluster closer to the orange cluster to the life science cluster and it has quite been a challenge. So today I would like to present to you the state of play of the EOSC Association because I think it's important to understand where do we stand at the moment with the association and uh, what can we, let's say, deliver and green, ah, oh yeah, sorry, this one and what not at the moment. So EOSC started much earlier than the association and this is the overview of the Horizon 2020 projects that have been funded in the last seven years and as you can see many of them are still ongoing and like shock they are coming to an end this year or next year and many of them are now asking what's happening next and I will come to that how we want to interact and structure the dialogue with the ongoing Horizon 2020 projects. Oh. There, unfortunately, it's corrupted. But anyway, there, what you don't see here is um, how much money um, Horizon 20 has invested into cluster-related projects. You see um, your colors. You missed the figures, but the total is 100 million euros. So that's, I think, something to keep in mind um, when also talking about future funding from the Commission because they are adding up those numbers. Um, uh, quick summary of how the EOS governance has evolved. It was in 2019 and 2020 when there were different, let's say, structures in place um, uh, trying to figure out how to address going forward. And then it was uh, between the member states and the European Commission that they decided the best way to address it is in a partnership under the framework of the Horizon Europe Framework Programme. 
And in order to enter a partnership, you need to have a partner. And that's why also the EOSC Association, as the voice of the community, was established in 2020 and then entered in this um, co-programmed EOSC partnership in summer last year. So that's the history here. And the EOSC Association purpose is to provide a single voice for the uh, voice for the advocacy and representation of the broader EOSC stakeholder community to promote the alignment of European Union research policy and priorities with activities coordinated by the association and to enable seamless access to data through interoperable services that address the entire research data lifecycle. And as a reminder, founded in 2020, but in fact only fully operational as of November last year. For our member base, we do have 234 organizations that are members of the association, and the majority of them are the members, 161, the others are observers, and um, the division and the split into the different categories very well represents the landscape, with the majority of them being research performing organizations, and I would guess that many of the infrastructures have ticked that box when um, uh, assigning themselves to a category, then the service providing organizations organization and the funders. And the geographical distribution is that we have a strong representation in the, let's say, more in the south um, east, and then the further you go to the uh, southwest, and the further you go to the east, um, the representation um, is limited, and sometimes it's only just one mandated organization. As I said, we are framed in this co-programmed partnership, and that gives us rights and obligations. And um, this partnership is governed by a memorandum of understanding, which has a duration of 10 years. So that leads us to the end of Horizon Europe plus three years additional implementation framework. And it's not legally binding. And um, uh, the scope and the objectives is to contribute to the objectives defined in the strategic research and innovation agenda, um, including the KPIs. And the Commission committed to invest in the next seven years 490 million euros into ESC-related activities that will be rolled out in grants, so the normal procedure, so to speak. And we as an association and the members of the associations, they have committed, they will chip in the same amount as in-kind contributions through what we call additional activities. So that's the financial framework. And when it comes to the rights that we gain with this is that the, uh, the European Commission, when drafting those calls, they have to take into account the advice of the association. And the advice of the association is the advice of its members. And for that, we have consulted the membership either directly or through the task forces to contribute and shape the now 23-24 work program. And I hope that some of you find themselves in this work program that's now in the procedure being negotiated between the Commission and the Member States. So the status we're in now, it's out of our hands, but it's the negotiating and the bargaining between the Commission and the Member States and the next program committees on the 17th of May. How is this governed? And I think that's something important I would like to point out. It's not only the Commission and the Association in this partnership, it's also the Member States. And the Member States are um, coming together in the so-called Steering Committee, which is headed by the French representative Volker Beckmann. And that is something where I would like to advocate for opening the view in how we can better also organize ourselves on a national level in order to uh, move towards EOSC. And so for closing the loop, that's what we are doing now in the association. We want to understand the results and the impacts of these, at the moment, 20 ongoing Horizon 2020 projects in order to see how can we take care of that and move that forward. And for that, we do have a first workshop tomorrow morning. Then we want to align with the newly established Horizon Europe projects, because now we have nine coming online and more in the following years. And there we do have the support of DG Research, REA and Connect in order to have a close alignment, because all those other projects, I think the clusters have been a good, let's say, presentation of how collaboration can work, but not necessarily all the other projects have talked to each other or even aware of each other. 
We want to facilitate the collaboration of those projects with our own task forces and, as I mentioned, close the loop on a national level because I think this is also the member states, they will play a big part in the future sustainability of EOSC. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Ute. Um, now we move to a person that you know very, very well. He used to be the director of CESDA. He used to be uh, representing uh, CESDA as coordinator uh, for the shock for a very, very long time, almost to the end. Uh, now serving as the director of the open science at Technopolis and also leading uh, second phase of, of EOSC, which is EOSC Future Project. So, Ron Decker. Thank you. And uh, yes, good to be back. And uh, when I opened the goodie bag yesterday, I found out I'm a shock champion. Probably that is because of, uh, I was always on time with my timesheets, uh, Martina and Panayota. So uh, thank you for, for this. Um, yes, shock is coming to an end. Uh, is the life after shock? Uh, yes, there is. That, that, that's the good news. Uh, so, so let's uh, have a look. And as Ivana said, I'm now uh, working on EOSC Future. If we can have the next, can I do it myself? Or? Green. Green. There are two greens, that's confusing. Um, okay, so for me to explain EOSC in two minutes, that, that, that's impossible. I think a, a key feature is to connect to connect research infrastructures, to connect with what we call e-infrastructures, so where you have the storage, the, the computing, the networking, which is not discipline uh, dependent. And it's, it's connecting with uh, some, some core and some basic functionality of, of EOSC. And that's what all these, these arrows represent. So the, the first one, A, is to connect to basic functionality of, of EOSC. Uh, up to D, where you have a connection between the clusters among themselves. And the other ones are uh, related to how you connect a cluster with an e-infrastructure. I think this is a, the, the, the basic of, of EOSC. As, as Ute already mentioned, it's not about uh, building new infrastructures. It's better connecting and making use of what is already out there. And as Giovanni said, it's, it's about uh, change the way we perform science. And this is for me also the, the next step. EOSC uh, is, is good and fine, but let's talk about the research. Uh, we, we serve research and that, that should be the ultimate goal of any research infrastructure and EOSC and whatever. And uh, I just borrowed uh, the slide from Envry Fair where they uh, related how infrastructures can help the, the, the science and to improve collaborations and to, uh, to have networks, networks of people, not of machines or, or IT, it's network of people. And together we can do things that alone you cannot, uh, you, you cannot solve. And looking forward, I see uh, another topic coming up at the, uh, at the horizon, and that's data spaces. It's now pretty hot, pretty trending uh, at the European Commission. There are data spaces that want to connect on a topic, uh, for example, on oceans or agriculture, and combine research data with government data and industrial data. And I think here, you, you see the resemblance with, uh, with what uh, was happening in shock and also in, in EOSC now is uh, take care of the data, including sensitive data, but also create new value. Uh, one of the features of EOSC is this composability where you start combining data from different domains or start combining data with large e-infrastructures, like large computing facilities to make this easier. And to, um, to conclude on the life after shock, I think there is a trend. A, a trend is that 
research infrastructures, facilities, they go from supply-driven, what can we provide, to demand-driven, what does the user want? I think that is the big, a big shift going on. And I, therefore, I'm very happy that this uh, MOU uh, by Shock was signed, because that's, for me, an important signal that even when the project is over, when the funding is over, that the partners still think and still find that they should continue in the collaboration. And I think that this is a very strong signal to have this MOU. And it connects to, to, um, to the next item, which is bring in the research communities, bring in the researchers. And they can, uh, I think they can also join this, uh, this MOU as a research community. And then you can start mingling with the other science domains, not only at, uh, at, at a higher level, but even at the level of individual research infrastructures or individual research groups. And my prediction is that research infrastructures will engage in data spaces, uh, combining other types. We have one example in the Netherlands, it's the Odyssey project, where you see data from national statistics, the planning bureaus, research data being combined together and make it easier for researchers, for users to, to have access to this data. And to close the loop, uh, I took the picture from the beginning when we had the kickoff in Utrecht. And as you can see, it's still Francisca with the laptop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for contributing to the shock project and see you in another project. Thanks, Ron. Thanks a lot. Um, I would like to invite uh, Laura Morales as the next speaker. She's a professor in comparative politics at Sciences Po in Paris. She is also chair of the Cost Action. At McSurvey Data, she leads uh, one of the tasks in uh, Shock Work Package 9, coordinating the work of the ethnic and migrant studies data community. She also has many hats, as, as all our panelists. So uh, she uh, recently joined the EOS Task Force on Research Engagement and Adoption. And she is also part of the EOS Future User Group. Laura, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Ivana. Uh, I'm really very pleased and, and honored uh, to have been invited to, to this panel. Um, but my, my role and my contribution to SHOCK and, and to EOSC is a, a lot more uh, modest than the, the previous um, as speakers. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, which will be probably the majority of you, um, I'm one of these sort of end user uh, researchers. I'm a professor in comparative politics. I've, uh, as uh, Ivana just said, I've also be chairing, I've been chairing a, a cost action until uh, very recently, uh, specifically on topics relating uh, to ethnic and migrant minority um, studies. And my day job is to, to teach and, and do research and uh, sort of run projects and uh, write publications and train um, junior researchers and uh, just uh, teach undergraduate courses as well. Um, and although I do have a, a bit of prior experience and, and knowledge in, in, in some of the now consolidated infrastructures, in my early days as a PhD student, I was working in the Spanish team of the European Social Survey, so the team that was conducting fieldwork there. I'm not really a data infrastructures person. So I've uh, sort of, uh, 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 in the end, my, my life has sort of guided me to, to shock and to the work that we do in the context of that um, cost action and in the context of work package nine um, in in shock, but my day job is not to uh, not really to 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 work on on data infrastructure. So, in shock uh, uh, with Ami Saji and and with other researchers at Sciences Po, as uh, uh, we learned yesterday, seventy seven percent of you actually know we've been sort of. Uh, working really hard uh, um, in the context also of the, of the cost action to produce the ethnic and migrant minority survey registry. We've really uh, banged uh, around a, a base camp and all sorts of uh, email uh, uh, newsletters um, about this, uh, but we've also been working uh, more recently on a question data bank. And both um, initiatives alongside with uh, numerous training materials and, and videos that we've been producing on, around these two tools, 
um, were uh, uh, um, really coming from the ground up. So it was this sort of grassroots network of uh, researchers uh, really interested in the integration and the inclusion of ethnic and migrant minorities across Europe that saw the need, as Case van der Rijke very uh, well pointed to this morning, that we saw the need to sort of come together and join efforts to create a, a, a small data infrastructure, so small uh, uh, tools and resources and, and services that can actually foster collaboration across Europe and, and provide us with the necessary data uh, tools to be able to improve our analytical capacities and our ability to say substantive things about the integration, the inclusion of ethnic and migrant uh, minorities. Um, so within uh, EOSC, in reality, I've, I've, I've had only very minor roles uh, uh, so far. I'm learning about EOSC as we go, and I, I should stress, I've stressed it uh, uh, before, that EOSC is really very, very complex. And um, I, I agree with some of the, the, the things that have been said uh, uh, previously. I do think that researchers on the ground will need to have at least a kind of superficial understanding of what EOSC sort of is so that we can really make, make use of it. And I've been trying myself to, to, to get to know this uh, better. Our first experience was with the EOSC um, uh, catalog and marketplace, and uh, we've actually um, onboarded uh, the, the survey registry already with the support of both uh, uh, people at Shock, uh, but also uh, uh, an in-kind support by um, the EOSC pillar um, open call for thematic uh, services for communities. And currently, as uh, Ivana said, I'm, I'm trying to contribute with uh, whatever uh, uh, small ideas I can uh, to the EOSC Future User Group and to the EOSC Task Force on Researcher Engagement um, and Adoption. Now, I want to emphasize, and, and I will be finishing very soon, um, how Shocked has really helped our data community. And, and obviously, the funding, uh, uh, putting the cost action on steroids, as uh, Case van der Eyck put it this morning, has certainly been one of those contributions. But I would like to emphasize a lot of the more immaterial contributions that Shock really uh, uh, brought to us. And, and this is something that I think could perhaps help guide some of the uh, strategies and, and steps moving forward of what the cluster now, Shock as, as a cluster, could bring forward, uh, which is essential as an essential support network with technical knowledge and resources that your average ordinary grassroots uh, researcher in the social sciences and the humanities probably doesn't really um, have. Uh, and they might have a lot of very important ideas of what sort of tools and resources they need, but they don't have the, the technical know-how of how to get there. Uh, but also, uh, shock represented for us the ability to be able to reach out to a wider um, uh, range of researchers and experts in, in the social science and, human, and humanities, and to be able to establish collaborations that otherwise uh, wouldn't have um, emerged. So we've learned a lot, for example, uh, from, from colleagues uh, uh, in Gizis. We've also learned a lot um, uh, from colleagues uh, uh, in Ausda. We've learned a lot about, uh, about colleagues um, in, in the European Value Survey and the European Social Survey as well. And those are really uh, very good contributions um, uh, for us. Um, additionally, uh, the added value for uh, EOSC for our data community, as I see it right now, and there's, there's a lot there that I still don't see very clearly, and I, I hope to be able to see in the future, is that it can really become this has this potential to become a one-stop shop where we can go to search kind of really targeted um, uh, uh, data, tools, uh, services, but also training materials and other resources that are important for our day-to-day -day, um, job, but also to establish uh, uh, potential ideas and connections with other research communities, whether in the social science and the humanities, or perhaps ideally in the future in other disciplinary fields beyond the social sciences and um, and the, the community uh, uh, and the humanities now what I think is probably the missing uh, uh, part uh, uh, in this big picture is that um, awareness and adoption uh, of EOSC uh, uh, by the on the ground researchers uh, is still an issue 
Uh, most of my colleagues who are not uh, part of shock uh, and are not really uh, engaged in any sort of data infrastructure or infrastructure or data related project have not even heard of EOSC. Uh, and these are people who are applying for Horizon Europe grants and uh, EOSC is mentioned systematically in the Horizon Europe grants. So, so this is something that needs to be uh, 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 built further. Now, Final points that I wanted to sort of bring up, uh, no definitive answers, uh, but some points perhaps for uh, discussion for our round table and our panel now. Um, uh, first of all, I wanted to emphasize the fact that end user communities uh, should not be perceived just as this passive set of users that will be uh, uh, um, uh, uh, accessing the services, the tools, the resources that are put up there or out there on uh, EOS or on shock at some point, but but actually that they do have a lot of uh, uh, genuine and novel uh, uh, um, ideas uh, of how to make uh, uh, their data, their research, and their outputs uh, fair and open science. Uh, but what they're very often lacking, as I said before, is perhaps the technical skills, the time, the human resources to put those ideas uh, into practice. So any uh, strategic initiatives or, or, or kind of project streams where you explicitly invite these collaborations with on the ground researchers who are not really connected to any uh, data infrastructures to collaborate or propose collaborations with the actual uh, 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 research infrastructures might be very useful. Or uh, um, uh, other types of uh, funding schemes that would allow to uh, identify needs um, in, in some form of co-development of, of tools by on the ground researchers. Um, what I see is obviously uh, challenges uh, for that sort of integration. There needs to be clearly uh, funding streams that will allow on the one hand those collaborations to be nurtured, but on the other hand, to sustain whatever uh, um, uh, tools and services can be developed from those collaborations, those that have already been developed in shock, but those that will be developed in the future as well, because the complexities of this technical landscape for researchers really requires a lot of hands-on uh, support and, and resources. But at the end of the day, I do see a lot of opportunities uh, because uh, at least from my perspective as a, as a grassroots researcher, uh, um, uh, the, the, the research infrastructure and uh, as we are in an excellent position to really support um, and use our researcher needs um, and uh, there can be all sorts of imaginative schemes that go beyond just the specific uh, agenda of priorities that some of the research infrastructures might have as a default which are uh, very useful as well uh, but that can perhaps be complemented with um, alternative uh, uh, ideas and schemes. Thank you very much and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks to Laura. And last, not least at all, uh, Rudolf Dimper. I hope Rudolf can hear us, see us. Hi, Rudolf. So just, just very, very quickly, uh, a bit of uh, information on Rudolf. So he is an IT advisor to the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, SRF, um, and before 21 to 20, 2010, uh, he was head of the Computing Services Division and from 2020, 2010 to 2019, head of the ESRF Technical Infrastructure Division. Uh, currently representing ESRF in the EOSC Association, participates in EOSC projects as a representative of the photon and neutron research infrastructure community, and in particular here today with the head of the PANOSC project. Have I missed anything? Uh, no, I hope you can hear me. It yeah, seems yeah. You may loud, have a... loud and clear. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much for accepting me. I'm, I realize that uh, I caused you a lot of trouble because being the only on, you know, online person, you know, it's great being with you. So thank you for the fantastic organization of this workshop and I'm looking forward for our discussion. Thanks a lot, Rudolf. We are very happy to have you here, even even yeah. even if it's online and it's only you know picture picture of you instead of having you in person. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a number of questions, and if you remember the structure that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the proposal is to go through them and then go to the audience. On that note, um, as I understood from Marika, there were no questions from the online audience. At least, at least that was the situation like 10 minutes ago. Uh, but I hope that, that, that questions are coming and that our online participants have been uh, 
sort of inspired by, by, by the pitches uh, from, from our esteemed guests. Um, Ivan, nevertheless, yeah. Ivan, there are no, no questions yet, but we, we really uh, encourage people to do so. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank so you. we'll get, get, get back to those. Um, in the meantime, I would like to address some of the questions that you can see um, on, on the screen uh, to, to our panelists. So let's start with the first one. Um, and I will address it to certain people, but of course other panelists are also invited to, to, to um, present their opinion on it. So what is the added value for S3 clusters to collaborate in the context of EOSC? And that one uh, I would like to address to Ute, Rudolf and Giovanni. But of course, as said, others, please, please join in. So Ute, Rudolf and Giovanni. Hello, hello. Yes. Hello. Okay, it works. So, um, uh, yeah, thanks. I think it's obvious that there are lots of um, advantages for this collaboration and I have been, I mean, as I said, involved already um, when I had, when I was in the purple cluster at the European uh, Spallation Source. And what you can see from, let's say, also the funding schemes that are out there, they anyway ask the clusters and the scientific domains to collaborate. I think it will be very challenging in the future to offer projects to funding agencies that don't address those issues. And then, I mean, EOSC is an obvious tool so to speak, to keep in mind. And I mean, with what I try to show in my pie charts with all the numbers, um, is that I hope that also the activities under Horizon 2020 really helped the clusters to establish a structured dialogue with each other in order to encourage cross-domain um, collaboration. Yeah. No, he's working, he's working. Okay, so um, I start from the, uh, the, the, the Ute's chart. Mm -hmm. Just to remind to everybody, as Ute was showing, I think I'm not wrong, if I sum up the institute and the agencies, the majority of the EOSC Association uh, members are research institutes. So EOSC is uh, to do with science and research, first of all. Therefore, it is natural that uh, the added value uh, uh, is there because it's about science, because our national stakeholders are also members of the association. Maybe I can answer this question in a complementary way, saying um, since the majority of the OSC Association members are research institutes, and since uh, the clusters are associating research infrastructures, um, let's focus on the EOSC Association, the EOSC Association Board. It is a straightforward that, uh, not straightforward, I would say it is uh, mandatory that the EOSC Association and the Board dialogue with each uh, research infrastructure to capture what uh, is expected or to bring them in the uh, challenge of open science. But I believe that you have a wonderful entry point by domain if you talk with five instead of more than hundreds of, of research infrastructures. Um, furthermore, and now I risk to repeat what I said at the beginning, uh, our aim is to gather uh, and to shape the famous toaster of the introductory talk, yes, the toaster, the upgrade of the toaster by because the EOSC was considered as a sort of toaster. And, uh, we, we do upgrade the toaster by considering the expectations and requirements of the scientists and uh, that are uh, the main uh, uh, shareholders uh, of our challenges. So I like the, obviously I like this paradigm toaster eh, because this reminds me of my uh, old laptops when I had them on my lap. No, so I have, obviously I missed something. Can you hear me? I'm not sure yes. because yeah, okay, great. So in the, my take on this, what is uh, so what is the added value for S3 clusters to collaborate in the context of EOS? Now, I would say one single word: line alignment. Now, we have to align now what we are doing. We cannot do anything in in isolation. We have to do it together, and we are trying, as has been said also by Laura. Now, we are trying to do something really complex. Uh, the, the basic concepts, they sound easy, straightforward. We are talking about the European Open Science Cloud. So you take those uh, acronyms, 
uh, these letters, European, Open Science, and then Cloud. But in a, in taking everything together, you are really in front of something really complicated. In a, first of all, Open Science needs fair data. Fair data implementing it is extremely in a, difficult. It's a big job. In a, we have to be in that together, in a, not only one community, but all communities, because in a, if we ever want to reach interdisciplinarity, we have to do something which really works together. So in a, in a joining our forces and exchanging how we do things is extremely important. So that's one point. Speaking up with one point, with one single voice you know, towards the main stakeholders, and that is the Commission. It is the ESC Association, but it's also ESC Future. Now, with our combined forces representing quite a large fraction of the science uh, in, uh, area in Europe, you know, the science clusters are in a, a large in a, in a fraction of CRIs. Is very important you know, because this, of course, is, uh, creates an important interface. You know, we also will have to promote, you know, as Laura again said correctly, the fact that EOSC exists. We have to tell our scientific communities, and we are doing it, that EOSC exists. Who else can do that? You know, we are an ideal you know, in a shop, the clusters, to do this. We also have to talk to our lab management and make sure that uh, EOSC is known that open science is promoted, that we have the backup of our lab management to interact you know, with the European Open Science Cloud and to bring these developments forward. This sounds obvious, but it's not. Open science is not yet a done deal. Fair data is not yet a done deal. There is still a lot of work which needs to be done. And then, of course, the more complex things, which are already uh, mentioned a lot and which uh, relate to this vision, uh, that ultimately the ocean of fair data will allow interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary work. This uh, will also still need a lot uh, of additional work, and this goes into software development, uh, but we come to this maybe a little bit later, where we can not uh, actually envisage to do those things in, in, in isolation. We have to work together. Thanks a lot, Rudolf. Um, on this note, I, I can only imagine that both, sorry, oh, sorry, that both Ron and, and Laura have something to add on opens, or openness and, and, and fair. I'm not pushing you, but if you have, say. <laughs> Where should we start? <laughs> I, I think that um, this will change. It's very variable depending on the disciplines, but there's a number of uh, disciplines in, in the social sciences um, where there's still a lot of reticence um, and reluctance around uh, the open science and open data agenda that we should not dismiss. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, there, and, and that's one important, very important challenge for adoption. Knowledge and awareness is another one about even where to get started to make uh, uh, the data uh, fair and, and, and made it, make it open. Um, but reluctance that it's genuine and it's legitimate about concerns relating, for example, to um, the anonymity and uh, the protections of um, uh, the subjects that participated in social science research. I'm thinking particularly about uh, uh, qualitative researchers in, in sociology or in anthropology or in political science that do a lot of ethnographic and, and, and qualitative biographical um, interviews and, and material. There, there are genuine issues there that need to be tackled and there will be resistance. Um, in addition to that resistance that we need to, in a smart and constructive way to try to gradually overcome, there is a serious problem, and I cannot really speak for other domains, but for uh, the social sciences of on the ground resources and, and capabilities. So as a researcher in a very well-resourced university in France, um, and, and having worked in, in, in the UK and in Spain as well, everywhere I go, the main issue is that universities don't have enough uh, um, technical expertise to support researchers to make their data fair. So even if they would be willing to do that, 
it is not feasible for most researchers with their day jobs and pressures to do everything that technically is required to document their research uh, 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 data and the research outputs in a way that it's fair and complies with expectations. So a conversation needs to be had into in which ways uh, uh, um, uh, national, regional, and university level funding will really trickle down to provide that support to the underground researchers. Because without that, uh, a lot of this agenda might fail uh, uh, just because of capacity as well. Yes. I want to pick up on the resistance and the alignment. Um, resistance, when we were preparing for shock, we, we, we got this message from the EC, you have to work together, you have to be in one cluster, SSH. And then we had discussions, why, why the humanities led to one social sciences, and what do we have in common? And, and these discussions were uh, heavily uh, be, be before we started the project. Luckily, I, I think once shock got started, we did find out what were the similarities, where we could overlap, where we could complement each other. And, and perhaps that also goes for the other clusters. And I think that that also addresses uh, perhaps an issue with EOSC. If, if you don't know what, what you're getting, what EOSC is about, then there might be hesitation or even resistance to, to enter this field because you, you, you don't know what to expect. That's, that's one. And um, on the other one, um, yeah, let's, let's focus on the, on the alignment, uh, as Rudolf said. And for, for me, the clusters are a, a way to do it. It's not a goal on itself. So let's keep the, 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 the higher goal, this alignment, to do better uh, research or to do research in a better way. Uh, to, to have this goal, and whether that is with clusters or EOSC or something else, that's secondary. Thanks a lot. I have to speed up a bit. Um, how to mobilize clusters as an organizational framework for new topics and future collaborations? Giovanni and Francisca. Okay. Does it work? Yes. Um, okay. I think Ron is already anticipating a little bit the, the things that I wanted to share with you. Um, the, we, we, I also said before on about the, um, the bridges against the, the societal barriers that we are experiencing, and Ron was, was reminding this. And I think what, what was the successful uh, approach from the European Commission is that this time, uh, four years ago, three years ago, uh, uh, the, the, the Commission asked the community to federate in cluster, ask the, the uh, commitment of the legal entities of the S3s um, into the project, and then uh, proposing as a scope, precise scope, which was uh, the data, the fair data stewardship, and furthermore linked to EOSC. At the time, so uh, Ute, I agree, we have done some important steps, but at the time, and until now is still valid, was a, and it is a concept of open science, of open research, that the clusters started to implement through their own community vision. So the question about how to mobilize the cluster uh, for the future collaboration, I think this is the approach that we want to keep also for the future. Um, the fact that we um, have been keeping uh, um, important uh, communication channels among us, but also with the boards, the S3 board, the EOSC Association board, and the European Commission. Um, uh, uh, it is based on the fact, and we do repeat, we declare here, uh, the cluster, or at least the cluster coordinators have declared that we, they want, we want to be as much as possible inclusive for the future. Indeed, we are going farther than the S3s, we talk about research infrastructures. We want to consider also eventually um, uh, domains that are not yet covered, including the so-called log tail of science. 
and so, so on and so forth. Now, why we do this? Because, as I said, I repeat once again, we keep uh, uh, at the center uh, the both the top-down and the, and the bottom-up approaches. Furthermore, we don't, therefore, we combine also with the inclusive approach. Then at the end, what we can do is that we want to figure out what the researchers want. Now, if we keep doing in such a way, we can also envisage to prepare ourselves in the health implementation to respond to users. Now, be careful. Now, I'm talking about users because I refer to the fact that the cluster and the cluster actions can be also um, propose data to fellow citizens through the citizen science project. Those are users can propose a sort of education program to students in the schools, in the high schools. So those are the users. Researchers are not the users. Researchers are the, those who produces, produce the, the data and consume the data. So are part of the business. Once we said that, and considering further also that we are now in a world where we have to combine science, innovation, and society, it is straightforward that we could commit as clusters also in um, challenge-driven project and therefore leverage the so-called interdisciplinarity. But once again, as we said also yesterday, not running after the fact that we have to be transdisciplinary. This is, we, we do what we want to do because we are scientists and our scientific taste and goal remains at the center. But the fact that my colleague for, from EOSC Life, just to give you an example, can drive an action in Horizon Europe for health and then the particle nuclear physics can participate because they have something to do about the health the cooperation with the clusters and the OSC framework will help in this sense. That's exactly the same for the Green Deal. We can have the, um, uh, uh, the uh, Envry Fair cluster leading a project, but we could participate, the other cluster could participate because they could contribute. In such a way, we build the interdisciplinarity for the benefit of the society. But this is in parallel with the scientific goals. Okay. Um, yeah, for me, uh, the first, um, so the question is how, huh? um, but the why is of course uh, um, not something that you can just uh, pass by. And, and I think I, I said it in this room, maybe before you entered already a few times. For me, the, the importance of the clusters is that it is the place where the thematic approach is central. Uh, so the, whatever uh, clusters and, and uh, uh, the research infrastructures that they uh, incorporate or that they include or that they are built of, whatever they put on the agenda is driven by a research agenda. And um, uh, I think this is what we need uh, uh, in order to make a success out of the digital transformation that is it's a societal uh, process, but it is of course also affecting and has affected uh, already for many years uh, the way um, the science is organized. And um, if there is, there's all kinds of policy instruments around that um, and uh, they tend to be generic. Uh, they, they tend to be given in either by very uh, generic concept or by national interest or by uh, specific uh, budgets that are not targeted to a specific research agenda. And I think in order to make sure that uh, the investments in infrastructure uh, are deeply informed by uh, a research agenda, you need something in between the researchers and, and the top level uh, policies that are um, being offered or being uh, implemented and however you you can slice the pie of, of science agendas in many ways and for historical reasons we are now here with the clusters that we have but i do think even though there is something arbitrary about why for example aries is in ssh rather than in uh, one of the physics clusters etc um, th it's working we have learned to understand each other the size that comes with the current division is somehow right and, and um, now that we have that, I think uh, 
it, it is easy to um, for the clusters to, if, if they all agree, and they seem to, huh, um, to continue that collaboration and to exchange best, best practices and to um, indeed embark on um, mission-driven research together under the leadership of whoever is the most appropriate for the topic, etc. Um, so I, I do think for all the topical activities, uh, the clusters are very, very well positioned. Thanks a lot. Um, we move further because we're running out yeah. of time. Uh, Cross-disciplinary collaboration. Why, how, which topics and what's next? And actually, I would like to address this one to Rudolf and to Ron. So cross-disciplinary uh, cross disciplinary collaboration. Why, how, which topics, and what's next? And part of, of why I addressed it to you is that there are a lot of cross-disciplinary, cross-domain collaborations in EOS future. So reasoning behind it, why pursue it? Uh, are there other topics that we could cover? Yes, I, I can see. Um is this for yeah. yeah, I can, I can see the reasons for this cross uh, cross domain cross disciplinary collaboration, because some of these problems are becoming so complex, and that goes for both scientific and social problems, that you need uh, you you need to collaborate, um, and and we all know the examples of of, of COVID, uh, and uh, but I also want to push back a little bit on this, um, and that is. Uh, I think one of the reasons why there was uh, a vaccine that quickly was that there was room for research to do the, to, to run a, their own program, to, to do basic research and to be able to, to adapt to crisis like, like the COVID uh, when it popped up. But if, if you don't have a, a ground floor, a basement of, of this basic research, where you can develop uh, over time, and um, then, then the, the cross-disciplinary collaboration won't work. Um, look at the European Social Survey. That, that took 20 years to, to be where it is now. And uh, if, if you don't build up this expertise over time, and it takes time, it takes long time, and um, I'm a little bit uh, hesitant or want to push back that you should give researchers, research infrastructures time to develop, time to build up. What we've done in shock, what you have done in shock, there, there, there will be uh, quite some results, but give it time to digest, give it time to mature. And, and then uh, and, and not run to the, to the next project. So I would ask for more bottom-up initiatives and leave it to the, to the researchers and the research infrastructures mm -hmm. as well. Give them trust to develop. And then if there is something you, you need to solve, the, 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 the clean oceans, the COVID, etc., then you can ask them to, uh, to adapt and be quick. But before that, you need some basic uh, fundamental research and basic infrastructures. Thanks a lot, Ron. Rudolf, same question from the angle of photon and neutron community. Your take Can on you, cross collaborations. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. No, well, no, I think, again, I can only... No, 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 actually continue what Ron has said. First of all, you know, before we talk about cross-disciplinary you know, research or collaboration, we have to make sure that we can actually do simple things with EOSC. That, mean, that means that we can reuse the data we have, that we can make it available, and that we have the basic tools. Now, I mentioned that we are creating an ocean of open data. Now we all know that life uh, comes from the ocean, first simple and then you know, with time more complex. And that probably will also be the case for cross-disciplinarity. So I would maybe say that you know, we should not drive, of course, and that's probably not our rule, we should not drive the, you know, you know, the cross-disciplinary scientific collaboration, but focus on the tools which can enable that. 
And what comes to my mind, uh, one of the tools where we still have a hell of a lot of work to do is machine learning. Now, it's complex, although now, a lot of tools start to pop up all over the place. It's complex you know, because you know, the algorithms are very complex. It's even more complex if you want to apply it you know, across disciplinary with data, which has not the same structure, you know, which has different metadata. You know, there, we, from our side, from the clusters, but also with the help of the infrastructures, have to develop the tools which enable these things. And this is, I mean, there are many examples, obviously. You know, when, Similarly, we have to you know, think hard how we actually do all these things you know, in a scalable fashion. You know, Cross-disciplinary, we, we, again, I say we are building an ocean of fair data, but the ocean is really big. And I'm not sure how we will manage in EOSC to handle really large data sets, you know, which are of fundamental and uh, you know, genuine open interest. No, we are having at the synchrotron here in Grenoble, we are having a project which highlights this. It is to build up an atlas, uh, you can say a catalog of human organs, you know, which are you know, imaged in three dimensions at extremely high resolution and which will be of general interest to all hospitals, to all physicians, you know, to visualize, to explore, so that you travel through the human body in extreme high resolution. How do you do that in the EOSC? And this, of course, you know, is where we have our role to drive the tools ahead and you know, make them make them such that they are usable for the scientific communities. Thank you. Thank you so much for that example to both of you. Um, again, sorry, need to speed up. How to continue to reach out to end user communities? I would like to address this one to Laura from the research pers researcher's perspective and then to Ute from a very high level perspective. And you know, EOSC is there for researchers. so. How to reach them so very different angles yes i think um that there's uh, multiple ways in which uh, uh, both the clusters but also eosk in, in in the future um can perhaps uh, uh contribute to kind of adoption and sort of real uh, engagement and and the first one that i would want to perhaps suggest that maybe it's not used as much as it could or in the ways or to the extent that it could is real in-kind support uh, by the research infrastructures uh, for ambitious uh, uh, fair projects that are proposed directly by uh, um, research groups or larger research communities. Uh, the size of who is proposing doesn't necessarily matter. What is of interest is what's the ambition of, of uh, 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 those uh, projects that want to make uh, research data and research outputs uh, fair. Um, and I think that in, in many cases there's out there, at least in the social sciences, which are the domains that I uh, know best, a, a lot of uh, uh, researchers that have really interesting ideas of uh, tools, services, some are relatively small scale or the others might be medium scale or large scale. Um, and what they might need is perhaps uh, 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 two or three people who are from one or several of the research infrastructures um, providing support to them, perhaps on a kind of 40% basis of their uh, uh, full-time equivalent uh, to make those ideas uh, become a reality because the, the, the technical skills and support that they might have at hand um, is not enough. So that can be a, a line of funding in, in the future. Uh, but the, this really needs to go beyond uh, traditional in-kind schemes, which tend to be very symbolic, uh, tend to be just a few hours of consultation. And this, is, this does not really uh, cut it. Uh, another thing that I would suggest perhaps is a, a clear strategy um, uh, um, overall, uh, whether it's centralized or decentralized, it doesn't really matter much. Um, of training and awareness raising, but really on the ground. Um, and, and what this means, and, and this is not really easy to do, but this needs to be very systematic. And at some point it needs to be organized in all universities, all research centers. Um, and, 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 and this needs to be properly planned and, and thought through 
um, because otherwise it will not trickle down fast enough uh, for adoption to happen. And finally, what I would perhaps suggest, and then this is something that I think it would not be too difficult to do, but it, again, someone needs to do the planning and the thinking of how to reach out. If you think about it, most researchers have at least an MA degree, a master's degree. So if you target the master's uh, 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 schools and uh, the PhD schools all across Europe, um, in five, six years, you will have uh, uh, the researchers of tomorrow fully trained in, in the FER uh, um, uh, uh, principles and in the FER agenda. And this needs to happen, I would say, in the scale of the next two to four years for us to really see a, 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 a true adoption um, of what we're trying collectively to build here in perhaps 10, ten years' time. Yeah, and I think what we as the association can support is, I mean, to really facilitate this process because what we are now have agreed to do with the members of the association, with those what we call mandated organization who represent the community of a particular country or constituency in the organization and with the member states represented in the steering board and the European Commission that we want to go out into the countries and organize national events where we bring the communities together and depending on what the needs in the countries are that we address those and there might be countries that are further advanced than others and then I think there we can, I mean, really highlight those issues because, and I think, let's say, adoption will also be driven, I guess, by what kind of support, and this is what you mentioned first, Laura, that, I mean, it's also about what kind of support resources are available, and this would be then the point to, I mean, flag that and address that to those who are shaping the funding programs. Thanks a lot. Giovanni? Would you like me? I would like. Does it, yeah. Uh, perfectly aligned with what my distinguished colleagues were saying r right now. I uh, want to give you two examples. When uh, we do develop uh, uh, within the escape cluster uh, the um, machine learning, deep learning methods for the analysis of our data, when we and, and we share in, in the cluster such uh, such know-how, such developments. When we share through the platforms that we build up, also such new workflows are part of the data that are going to be accessible and reproducible. Furthermore, the five clusters are in their own vision. They are looking forward to, as uh, Rudolf was saying, and it is also inspired by that, to work to, together about the software. Now, if we merge uh, the efforts, it's because uh, we, are, uh, we have aligned needs. But when we do this, uh, immediately we explain to um, EOSC Association globally that uh, what data are is even larger than what could naturally come to, to the spirit, come to the, to the mind. And furthermore, once this kind of a force, thanks to, thanks to EOSC some, somehow, um, it is done uh, collegially, we do put in place innovation scheme and training scheme to be ready also to educate uh, people responding to the European Union market, labor market. Therefore, automatically or indirectly, but I would say almost directly, we are responding to one of the societal challenge. Um, second example, uh, in our disciplines, we publish in a dedicated international journal also the uh, technological developments of uh, detectors, uh, sensors uh, that, uh, that merges uh, different uh, technologies from electronics, informatics to, to mechanics. Um, also, those publications are results, are data, and are written in, in, in journal, in article. Also, such results can have digital contents, and we could open up the digital contents to this. I can give you an exact example, because I have many of them in my mind, but I can guarantee that this kind of openness could participate to the sectoral data space of the manufacturing, therefore participating again to the socio-economic challenge of the European Union. Thanks a lot to all. Um, now
we are running out of time very, very quickly. Um, if you agree, I think we actually answered the last question. And the short one is, yes, we can contribute. The a bit longer one, we are already doing it, and especially in the, in the context of, of EOS Future with all, with all the test science projects. Um, so if we could actually speak, skip that one, I would like to, uh, to go to the audience and first to Marike and to online participants, because as I learned, there are several questions to our panelists. Hi, Ivana. Yes, we have three. There are, there are more or less comments with some, uh, some questions uh, hidden in it. So the first question that we, the first comment that we have is from Marin Anka Monica. Uh, and she says, it seems that the discussion is about H2020 uh, projects. Nonetheless, there are uh, a lot of research data as databases produced at national level, funded by EU funds, which are not open. For instance, on the intermediary and final evaluation of operational programs, but there are many more examples. So it would be very useful to include as mandatory making them public, as it will significantly contribute to trust in science and research in the EU, especially in new states with low administrative capacity, low degree of transparency, and include them in EOSC. So that's one of the comments we got. Um, let me continue with the second one, uh, Ivana. So comment to, uh, a comment to Laura. Uh, there are two excellent resources for sharing uh, qualitative data. The UK Data Service has practical advice and depositors to stories with sensitive qualitative data. And there's also the CESDA, data, uh, the CESDA Expert Data Management Guide. So that's a, a question from, from uh, Libby from Gessis. Uh, and then we, have a, then we have a question from Laura, uh, from Amelia Sant. Uh, and she thanks Laura. Uh, for asking for support from national, regional, university institutions. If we want an open science and fair principles, researchers have uh, their hands tied by the national evaluation agencies. Uh, they do not want to hear about fairy fairization uh, since they have the, to publish uh, quarter, one uh, quarter one paper, quality uh, papers. This is the main objective. So how to reach national evaluators, agencies, ministries to convince them of the need to implement fair principles? That's the latter one is a question. So thank you. Question, says. yeah. How, how to do it? <laughs> no, I really think the, the framework that we have um, with the EOS co-program partnership is the right one to address it because we have the commission, we have the national ministries included in this and we have the association. In the association, as Francisca has said, the task forces. So I think we have all the elements and then it is, I mean, to go out to the countries and talk to them. I mean, I mean, it sounds simple. I know it's not, but at least this would be the framework where we have, I mean, the commitment of the parties that we simply should use to our advantage. And, and there's an, in addition, of course, also something like the DORA declaration that also is an arguing or pleading for recognition of uh, uh, all kinds of research outputs other than, than, uh, uh, than publications. So this is a movement going on and has also been adopted by uh, the EOSC ecosystem. Can, can, we, can, we add, can we add that, as Francisca has just said, is a movement but this is one of the steps in which the, the, the crazy and aggressive agenda of EOS could be acceptable. <laughs> I mean, we should accelerate in this because we are saying that we want to also work in each cluster to the rewarding of scientists committing in open science and about the comment. We do not talk about free data. We talk about open research. There are data that are not free and are not come for free. But we are doing this. If you have an aggressive agenda, an aggressive agenda, also, aggressive agenda also with the EOSC Association in order to put in place this rewarding, it will be more useful than an aggressive agenda concerning the openness of all data. And, and, and we, should, we should educate the reviewers that work for journals. Um, they should always check whether data that have been cited are properly cited so that it brings reward to the people that uh, deposited the data. So there is no quick fix, but it's a process. And at least all the, all the stakeholders that have never been together on, at one table are now at the table. Laura, I wanted to add something. Yes, yeah, so I, I wanted to actually address the, the three points. So the first, starting about mandatory 
uh, um, elements uh, or constraining uh, elements or this the combination of sticks and carrots for people to really buy into the uh, um, the fair data and open uh, science um, agenda and, and principles. Um, there needs to be some of that, but I, I think that punitive um, initiatives are not enough if they don't come, and I stress this, with enough support. And um, funding agencies have, uh, and I say this from, from experience, and I, I, I have actually completely bought into the fur, and I had it before uh, the whole fur principles were uh, verbalized in, in that manner. Um, but we just simply don't have enough funding to do the data depositing stage, and we don't have local support. And I think that at some point, this needs to stick in policymakers' mind. Um, uh, researchers don't necessarily, the ones who are producing the data, don't necessarily have the technical skills to be the ones documenting the data that they produce. And this might seem puzzling to you, but this is the reality on the ground. Um, and they also very specially don't have the time to do that if in addition to uh, uh, doing the research and publishing uh, the results, they need to spend a lot of time documenting the process and um, the data. Now, a lot of the funding agencies have uh, uh, introduced these mandatory clauses and principles without adding any single euro of funding for that to actually happen. And there are ways in which that they could do that. They could, for example, uh, decide that for any every single project that they fund, there will be an allocation of X tens of thousands of euros that will be devoted for a data curator, a data steward, or call it whichever way you want it, a, 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 a data librarian that will be the one whose time will be bought out uh, from that funding to do the documentation. This is not happening at the time, at least in the social sciences for the most part. Now, um, this is what I mean with supporting uh, 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 researchers to implement the fair principles. Another element of what I was mentioning is uh, legitimate resistances that uh, uh, have to do with legitimate concerns about uh, ethical elements of the research conduct in the social sciences. And I'm very well aware of the existence of, of, of the various tools, resources, and uh, archives for uh, qualitative data. That was not my point. My point was that even if those uh, uh, resources, services, and tools exist, the researchers who produce qualitative data don't want to share the qualitative data because they have legitimate ethical concerns um, about that, and we've not, we're not making necessarily the efforts to overcome those resistances. And that takes a little bit more of dedication, and I would say, and I don't mean this in a negative way, not patronizing researchers. They are highly intelligent and skilled researchers, and they have very good reasons why they're objecting uh, to the imposition, what they seem, uh, they think it's an imposition to them of principles that they have not necessarily uh, uh, co-produced, uh, uh, at least not in their specific disciplinary areas. Thanks a lot, Laura. And Rudolf, sorry, I cannot see your hand, but Marike told me that, that you actually had a hand up for, for some time. So please, but briefly, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, very, very briefly. Uh, obviously, it's a movement. The fair data is a movement. And, uh, we can accelerate for sure, but uh, I fully agree with Laura that we should not work against scientists. However, the first step is that in every organization, be it a university, be it in a research infrastructure, and there needs to be a data policy, and the data policy ideally is uh, adhered to from all stakeholders inside the in the organization. This is something which uh, also, I mean, was one of the founding parameters of the science clusters, that you know, with the science clusters, we were able to ensure that all the participating partners have similar data policies. Thanks a lot. Uh, questions from the audience? It seems that you were very clear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, since there are no questions from the audience, uh, let us wrap this up. Uh, one sentence for the end from each of you, and then we are done. Then you are done, and you can be released. <laughs> so, we start with Francisca. Yeah, okay, well, picking up on what Rudolf was saying, I think an important 
uh, topic to be further explored is how the clusters and how EOSC uh, can divide the labor um, and the roles um, between them and uh, the local support uh, staff within universities. Researchers go, would prefer to first go next door where their data steward or their librarian or whatever uh, is there to help them. And they should be our contact in yes. uh, well, increasing the level of understanding of what uh, the clusters and EOS can do. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Giovanni? Uh, in, in, in particle physics, in astroparticle physics, uh, uh, nuclear physics, we are used uh, uh, to work uh, in a huge collaboration of uh, even thousands of skilled people. And we do work uh, through the best effort approach, but at the end as an orchestra. I think this is the approach uh, is, uh, is our education, is in our culture. And I think this kind of culture uh, is the one that I want to share and uh, uh, be brought by, by the full clusters. As we have said before, it is a long path. If we work together collectively, we can make very important big steps uh, uh, for, uh, for the final objectives. Uh, it's important to consider that there are intents for the next few years and keep in mind the final goal. For me, what matters more is understanding what are the expectations of next generation researchers. They are uh, uh, like my children tomorrow, <laughs> uh, people who are already aware of the uh, electronic environment, social network, therefore um, opening up and making everything digital and virtual is mandatory today. And we can do a very, very good job for society at large. Thanks a lot. Uta. EOSC is a journey. The EOSC Association has joined it recently and we want to do whatever we can to facilitate the success of it. Thank you very much. Ron? For me, it's, uh, it's, it's working together and let's do exciting things and uh, from items for which we don't know the outcome yet, but still go, go on this uh, together and let's realize that we want to do better science and if research infrastructures can support, they, they, they should every, wherever they can. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, so uh, for me, uh, I would say that, and this is mostly a message uh, for, for the future of shock, uh, that there's room, I think, for both uh, top-down uh, strategies and bottom-up uh, collaborations. And I, I, I would wish that in the future, the next steps would allow for uh, streams of uh, uh, research co-production that sort of facilitate both, because I think that both really genuinely contribute um, to the fur movement and, and to make data and research more accessible to everyone. Thank you very much. Rudolf, last words. <laughs> Lucky me. <laughs> so uh, I would wish that whatever we do, we do it for the researchers, for the scientists, that uh, they can use it, pick it up and enhance their work, that it enhances their work, that the scientific output is uh, increased. Uh, and this would be a fantastic reward, and, uh, I think, for our work overall, for EOSC. Uh, and uh, no, at, at, from the point onward where scientists get engaged and they see that the stuff is useful, I think we are in business. You know, the thing is, uh, it will become sustainable, will fly, and will only produce uh, an, uh, more and a very exciting science. Thanks a lot to all our panelists. I would uh, like to invite you to join me in the round of applause, and they can return to their places. Thank you so much. Well, I need far more, five more minutes uh, and I was uh, asked to, to remind you that there will be a farewell coffee uh, from 4 to 4.30. We, we already uh, used a bit, of, a bit of that time. I hope it will be worth it. So let me try to sort of summarize the last, the last two, two days and, and, and wrap it up um, as, quick, as quickly as I can and as, as succinctly as I can. So um, in the last two days we sort of tried to relive um, the, the, the 40 months journey of, of shock. So we were um, sort of re reliving the positioning of shock in the wider landscape with ESRI, 
with the EC, uh, all the expectations and plans, and of course with with the with the big big cloud of of EOSC. Um, we presented tools, we presented services, uh, talked a bit about some issues, mostly interoperability, uh, about practical use of data and research. We tested them with shock and tell challenge. Then we discussed way forward with policymakers. We discussed it amongst ourselves uh, in very practical steps, like with MOU. We broke down the silos this, this morning just to build them again, but in a very good way, not the bad way. Um, we were fed occasionally. Uh, it was good. Uh, we also were provided coffee just to be able to, to, to move uh, a bit more. Um, and finally, we got with the last ses session uh, a peek into, into the future, what, what awaits, and, and I can only summarize it in, in two words, uh, a lot of work, three. Um, however, it's, it's been a journey. It, 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 it's been something. Um, and uh, of course, it, it, it is not, not over at all. So, before we say goodbye to each other, let me share with you um, some of the numbers. So we had um, almost 300 people registered, of which more than 90 here um, at the venue in Brussels. Uh, they represented 30 countries from EU and beyond, and we had uh, more than 15,000 impressions, and still counting on, on, on Twitter and, and, and social media. So that, these are some impressive numbers. Uh, from uh, registration forms, um, um, a great organizational team extracted um, the roles uh, that were mentioned. And you can see all kinds of roles uh, and, and people on different levels of their career, careers um, uh, involved in, in, in shock, which is literally amazing. Uh, but two, two roles sort of um, stand out and it's of course researchers and, and project managers and while we all know that researchers um, are, 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 are the content people um, this is this is my chance to thank all the project managers uh, that made this possible um, and uh, SESDA's coordination institution um, in that sense was was led by Martina Drascic this is this is my chance to say thanks to her and all to, others people, to other project managers. They are our toaster. They are toaster to daily bread of projects. So thank you so much. This wouldn't be possible without you. So that's the first applause. Now the second one, because this is our program committee that work uh, relentlessly for months to actually put all of this together in terms of content. So another one, please, for them. Thank you so much. not done. We have one more. And this is the organizing committee, people on land with their hands on, uh, making possible this final final conference. Uh, it was tricky to organize. It's a hybrid, which makes it even more complicated. So another big thank you to, to all the nice people from the institutions that are always there. And the final one. Instead of thanks and goodbye, this is actually a welcome and hello to the shock uh, or SSH open cluster. So welcome and hello, and let's continue. Shock is a project funded by the EU framework program Horizon 2020. It unites 28 partner organizations and their 25 associates in developing the social sciences and humanities area of the European Open Science Cloud. From January 2019 to April 2022, Shock transformed the current social sciences and humanities data landscape with its disciplinary silos and separate facilities into an integrated, cloud-based network of interconnected data infrastructures. To continue to break down the silos and ensure sustainability of our developed resources in the long run, we have onboarded more SSH research infrastructures, signed a memorandum of understanding to sustain results, and rebranded ourselves to the SSH Open Cluster.